So, um, I'm sorry I've been gone for a few weeks. We went on vacation, and uh, we just got back. We saw some icebergs. Um, one of my favorite things was looking out the window and seeing 12 icebergs um, on, near the ship. Uh, and we even saw some icebergs that were bigger than the ship. So that was um, pretty scary. Uh, but uh, fortunately, they have good radar, and so we were fine. We had a great captain. Uh, we had a great captain. His name was Tor, and every day he would come on the thing for the noon announcements. Uh, hello, good morning, or good afternoon. My name is Tor, and I work here. And according to the elevators, today is Saturday. Because, you know, they put the little days of the week on the floor of the elevator. So he was really funny. We enjoyed him. But we had a good trip, and we're glad to be back. But that's why we haven't had any recordings, and that's why we haven't had any studies in the last few weeks. Yeah, we're studying. Thank you. We're studying through the book of John. We're on chapter 18 today. Uh, but before we get started in chapter 18 of John, uh, we're going to do a little bit of talking about the Passover because it's important to the timing of what's going on with uh, what happened to Jesus. But before we get into that, does anybody have a Bible God question that they would like to talk about this morning? And I'm open to talking about anything. And if we don't get to the lesson, that's okay. Questions? Oh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Okay, good question. So the question is, uh, why did the Tower of Babel, uh, well, let me just, the question is about why did God do what he did at the Tower of Babel? So let's just go back a little bit and talk about that. Um, at that time, uh, the people were not worshiping God. They were doing what they wanted to do. They were choosing their own ways. They were not worshiping God. And they said, you know what? We don't have to do things the way God told us to do them. We don't have to do things the way the Bible says, to, or the way uh, the scripture had told them to do them that had been passed down and so on. Uh, what we can do is we can do whatever we want. And not only that, we can come up with our own way to get to heaven. Okay? And that's why they built the tower. And so they said, we're going to build a tower, and it's going to reach all the way to heaven, and we can get to heaven which is not unlike our culture today. In our world today, people are all walking around going, you know, I know how to get to heaven. You just have to do as more good things than bad things. Well, that's the, a lot of people in our society are saying this is the way that they're going to build their tower to get to heaven. And so um, they say, uh, is that right? Well, the problem is we have, what, what kind of God do you want to have? Do you want to have a God that punishes the people that hurt you? I do. I want a God that punishes the people that hurt my family. I want a God who, who makes those things work. Well, the problem is that um, I've done bad things, too, in my life. Um, if I come to your house and I break your clock, whether I did it on purpose or whether I did it by accident, I have created a debt. Have I not? I've created a debt to you. And the Bible says that if I hurt you, I'm also hurting God. So not only have I created a debt to you, I've also created a debt to God. Okay, so between you and me, I can say, hey, I tell you what, here's 20 bucks. I'm sorry for breaking your clock. Does that make it like it never happened? No, it doesn't. Well, what if I tell you I'll buy you another clock exactly like the one you have? Well, maybe your grandmother gave you that clock. The problem is there is nothing I can do to make it like it never happened. Uh, there's, uh, I can say, well, I'm going to go help a little old lady across the street to make up for breaking your clock. Does that make it like it never happened? No, it doesn't. So no amount of good things that I do can make up for the debt that I've created. Now, you may choose to forgive me and say, okay, don't worry about it, or yeah, thank you for the 20 bucks, or thank you for the new clock, or whatever. But the problem is I've also created a debt with God because I hurt you. And I'm using the example of a clock, but it could have been worse. I mean, I could have, you know, cut you or uh, something else. Y'all didn't even laugh on that one. <laughs> I could have cut you. What was that lady? I'm going to cut you. Uh, I could have done something worse to you or to your family or something like that. But, the, and, and, you know, in either way, the problem is, is that 
I've created this debt to God. And God's justice demands that every debt be paid. Every debt must be paid. And that's what we want, except for the problem is I have my own debts. I, I've said bad things about uh, By the way, any of you ever broken any of the Ten Commandments? It turns out all of us have broken every one of the Ten Commandments. You say, well, I've not murdered anybody. Yeah, but did you assassinate their character? Because Jesus says if you did it in your heart, you've done it. You're, you're guilty of that sin. So the problem is I have the sin on me. I can't get it off. And the Bible tells us the only way to get that sin off of me is uh, it, God says every sin has to be paid for. He says the only thing you can do is allow Jesus to pay that pay for that sin for you. And so that's what we talk about when we talk about getting saved. When we talk about allowing Jesus to take our sin upon him, uh, being born again. We're, we're, we die to our old self. That's what Josh was talking about this morning. Die to our old wishes and wants. Die to our old self and become uh, a new person in Christ. And when God looks at us then, he sees his perfect child. He doesn't see his sinful child. He sees his perfect child. And Jesus has taken that on us. So uh, I'm sorry for, I know you asked me that, and, and you asked me how to start a car, and I told you how to build an internal combustion engine. <laughs> but uh, the point is, is the Bible tells us uh, the way to heaven. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. Nobody. That's what Jesus said. Um, and so Jesus was either a liar or a lunatic or he was who he said he was. Um, in any case, so the way to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. And in the Old Testament, the way to get to God was by following what he told him to do. The Bible says that Abraham, for example, um, uh, had faith in God, looked forward to the Messiah but he did what God asked him to do, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And so at the Tower of Babel, I believe the king's name was Nimrod. Uh, and uh, you ever heard anybody, you Nimrod, uh, you Nimrod. Um, we're going to bring that back, by the way. We're going to start calling each other Nimrod. <laughs> anyway, uh, they said, we're going to build a tower. And so they built this tower. And the problem is, is that they're focused on, they're focused on building this tower. They're not focused on God. They're focused on trying to do it themselves. We have a problem here in the United States, especially where we want to. Most of the time, we want to pay our own way. We want to, we want to do it ourselves. And the Bible says we can't do it ourselves. Only Jesus can do it for us, and we have to, we have to accept that. We have to allow Him to do that. Um, but in any case. Uh, when we're not focused on God, what are we doing? We're building our own Tower of Babel. We're saying, you know, uh, I know if I can do enough good things, then I will balance out the bad things and I will be right with God. But that's not what it is. And when we're doing that, we're building our own Tower of Babel. And what does God do when we start building our own Tower of Babel? <laughs> he comes along and kicks us in my last name, doesn't he? Yes. <laughs> And he throws a wrench in the works or puts kittens in the engine or whatever you want to call it. And he, he throws something that he, um, he doesn't always do it himself, but he certainly allows everything to happen. He allows something to come into our lives that says, hey, wake up. You know, you're trying to do it yourself, but guess what? I am the only way, the truth and the life. And so it's when we hit those difficulties that we then turn and start to look to God. And that's exactly what happened with the Tower of Babel. He said, you guys are doing this thing. You're worshiping idols. You're trying to you know, build this your own way to heaven. This is ridiculous. I want, I want you guys to be focused on me. So poof, um, you guys are going to speak different languages. And so what happens if you're with a group of people who speak different languages? You kind of get together with the ones that speak the language you speak, right? Uh, isn't it true that we kind of, what's that old birds of a feather, right? Yeah, yeah so we kind of we kind of gather with other people who have like beliefs and like, uh, like languages in this particular case. And so that's what happened after the Tower of Babel. The people got together that had the like languages, and they couldn't understand those people. And so then they started moving out into different directions. And, you know, in the beginning, God told Abraham, uh, Adam and Eve, he said, you know, uh, conquer the earth and have dominion over it and multiply and 
all that kind of stuff. And they were not doing that. They were staying right here building their tower to God. And so in terms of your question, um, God changed all their languages because he wanted them to come focus on him instead of focusing on their own way of doing things. And so that's why he did it. Did that answer your question? You want a follow-up question or you're okay? Okay, good. <laughs> Mm. But she wants to know if I know the answer. No, um, I would just like to hear your truth about it. Because I like to listen to you. I don't know that. Um, you know, I think that I have to give her money after this. <laughs> no, but when God was talking and he talked about putting away the old self and the old sins and putting on the new self, but he never actually came out and said, you're still going to sin. You know what I mean? He, he, to me, or to maybe a new person, it might sound like he's saying you put that away and you never sin again. And if you do, you're not a good person or you're not God's child or whatever. And I believe that's what you're saying. Okay. Um. And so we are going to sin again. We are going to sin again. That's so true. Um, first off, what's the definition of sin? Okay. Uh, I believe the technical definition is missing God's mark. Okay. So God said, here's the target. This is what you need to hit. And, the tar and you say, well, what's the target? Well, the target's defined by God's word. He, he didn't just create an arbitrary target. He said, okay, here's my word. And sure enough, today... I can go anywhere and pick up a Bible and say, look, I can see exactly what God, how he wants me to live. Um, for example, uh, Ten Commandments. What about this don't steal thing? Right? You're not supposed to steal. But can you believe God told us to do that? Do not steal. That's ridiculous. If I want something, I ought to just take it. If I want John's pants, I ought to just take them. Right? Um, the, the, yeah. The, yeah. The, the problem is, is when I steal something, I hurt the other person. So I may have gotten something, but I'm also hurting them. So by God telling me not to steal, he's saying don't hurt that person. That's one part of that. But also, if I look at God's laws as things I can't do, I can't steal. Oh, that's kind of like I have to take out the trash. As opposed to I get to take out the trash. I get to do the laundry because I have multiple sets of clothes. Isn't that great? I get to do the laundry. I get to not steal so that I don't have to go to jail. I get to not steal so that I don't have to pay the consequences of that or uh, lying or whatever, whatever commandment you want to pull up. Okay. Um, I get to not do that thing so that I don't have to pay for those consequences. Right. And so when God told us these things to do, he wasn't just a killjoy like you think your parents are, right? No parties while I'm gone. And I'm pretty sure Teddy had a party at our house while we were gone. I told him no parties, but I'm sure he did. Uh, but in any case, uh, God's not just a killjoy. He gave us these rules because they keep us out of trouble. Okay? And so that's why we follow the rules of God. Well, first off, if you love somebody, you want to please them, right? And we love God because we love Jesus because he paid for our sins on the cross. And I've told you before, it wasn't just a physical problem. It wasn't just a physical death. It was paying for the sins on the cross as well as serving in eternity in hell in three days. And you're like, well, how did he do that in three days? Uh, he's God. He's not bound by time. He can do anything he needs to do. When you get to heaven, you can ask him about it. And if you don't get to heaven, then I'll ask him for you. But anyway, that was right across your head, right? What did the teacher say? The teacher said uh, 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 the, it was a school teacher, it was a public school teacher. Uh, uh, what about this Noah's flood thing? And is it real? And the little boy says, well, yeah, it's real. Well, how do you know? When I get to heaven, I'll ask Noah. And the teacher says, well, what if Noah's not in heaven? Uh, what if he's somewhere else? And the kid said, well, then you could ask him. So, okay. Uh, so we're back to the, what was the question again? Oh, still sin. Okay, good. 
Okay. So the Bible tells us that we're, uh, Jesus said, go and sin no more. What is that about? Well, he knew we were going to sin and we're going to continue to sin. Why? Because we're imperfect. We are imperfect people. We're still going to sin. The problem is what he's talking about is habitual sin. It's a sin we do over and over and over. Um, let's say um, my thing is gossip, uh, which reminds me of the three pastors. <laughs> These three pastors went on a trip together. They went to a conference, and they were at the hotel that night, and they were sitting there, and they go, you know, the Bible says we're supposed to share our sins one with another, and so let's do that. And so the first one, he's like, okay, well, you know, when I, um, uh, uh, John, would you go pull that shade down, please? When I, uh, when I go out of town, I like to go where people don't know me, and I'll have a little drink. I'll have some drinks where nobody knows. Okay, yeah. And the other one, uh, he, he's like, okay, well, it's your turn. He says, well, you know, when I go out of town, I like to do, I like the cards. I like to do a little card game, a little gambling. And he says, oh, okay. So they get the third guy, and they notice he's not even listening. He's packing up his stuff. And they go, what's going on here? How come you're packing? You look like you're leaving. He goes, yeah, uh, my sin is gossip. And so I have to get out. And so he's obviously going to go tell everybody. Right <laughs> So let's say, for example, my sin is gossip, and so if the Bible tells me to go and sin no more, it means I need to stop gossiping. It means I need to put that behind me. Now, you guys realize that I'm pulling up a sin. I could be talking about porn. I could be talking about all drugs. I could be talking about all kinds of stuff here, okay? Uh, but I'm using gossip because I want to be comfortable in a, in, in a room uh, and not... Um, because there's little ears in here. Okay, good. So we got that. In any case, the Bible talks about habitual sin. And so I may hurt your feelings because I, I, I might say something about your shirt or your pants or something. Uh, and then I go home and I'm like, oh, man, I can't believe I said that. And that's, that's an accidental sin. I did not do that on purpose, right? Um, the problem is, is the things that we do on purpose. Okay, that's the sin he's talking about, the sin we do on purpose. Um, what is the root of all sin? Pride. It's not money. Money is a root of sin. Okay, uh, And uh, having money is not sinful. Uh, using it inappropriately is sinful. Okay, But uh, the root of all sin is pride. You say, what's that about? Well, have you ever known a politician or a... Uh, TV preacher, uh, those kind of people who think that they are so high up that they can really do anything they want to do, and they say, you know what, I deserve this. Look at all I put in. Look at all I did. I deserve this. And, you know, we do the same thing. We go, you know, I deserve this third brownie because, you know, I, I deserve it. I had a hard day at work. I had to put up with the kids. I had to do whatever. I deserve this. You realize that every sin you've ever committed was fun. If it wasn't fun, if you didn't enjoy it, you would not do it. Okay? And so we, we choose to do those things because we say, okay, well, I'm going to be God for a few minutes. God told me not to do this thing, but you know what? <laughs> I'm going to be my own God, and I'm going to do it anyway because I deserve it. Um, and so that's really the problem. So when, when he's talking about going and sinning no more, he's talking about the sins that we do on purpose. And, and, and every one of us can think in your head right now, what's your pet sin? Every one of us has a pet sin that we know right now. You know what it is, you, you know. Um, and you're sitting there going, I hope it's not written on my face. <laughs> um, you know, maybe your sin is uh, eating too much, and so Carrie's here, and she's going to give us something to eat, and uh, it's I'm just going to be put. Oh, hi, yeah. Carrie. Hi, y'all. I'm going to be the doctor. Not in here. He's you probably in children. No. Anybody remember what I was talking about? Oh, pet sins, yeah. Brownies. Yeah. Brownies. You know, I, I'm telling you, when I get, like, depressed at home, I'm like, i got to make me a pan of brownies. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, I can eat a whole pan. Okay, 
Uh, and uh, the problem is, is, is we need to stop doing those things that we do continually. And you know what those are. Um, it's not my job to point out your sins. That's not my job. Uh, it's, only, it's only my job for my kids. When Alex was little, she would come and say, well, so-and-so is doing such and such. And I said, well, whose mommy are you? Okay, whose mommy are you? And so unless they're your kid or unless you're their pastor, then it's not really your job to point out anybody's wrongdoings. It's your job to love them like Jesus. It's your job to point them to Jesus. It's your job to bring them to Jesus. Uh, my favorite bumper sticker is, you catch them, he'll clean them. Uh, it's not our job to clean them up to get them to Jesus. It's our job to show them Jesus' love and let the rest of it happen. So I'm not judging any of you. And let me just tell you again, I am the chief of sinners in this room. I am the biggest sinner in this room. And you're saying, oh, no, how could that be? And I'm telling you, it's true. 100% it's true. And not only that, I am a leader of God, and I know better, and he holds me to a higher standard, which by itself makes me the worst of sinners in this room. Okay, So I am not judging anybody in here. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. The Bible says that we are to stop sinning and we stop sinning by those things that we do over and over and over, and we know that we're not supposed to do them. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, you're the only person in here older than me. Your fault. God doesn't stop pointing out those things. It's like being married, isn't it, right? You know, your wife points out those things, every one of them. Every day, there's a new one, uh, you know. Or your husband points out those things, you know. Uh, yeah, what Carol's talking about there is important, and it's unfortunate, too, because I personally, I want to take a giant step and be there. I want to take a giant step and be at perfection. I want to take a giant step and be at sin no more, but that's not the way it works. Everything in life is baby steps. Let me say that again so you can make sure you hear me. Everything in life is baby steps. A murderer does not one day wake up and say, hmm, I think I'll go kill somebody. That's not what they do. They start off going, you know, those people are not as, those people are not as good as me. Those people, and then they start hating people. Oh, you know, I hate those people. I wish, and then they go a little further and a little further. And every day they're taking a little baby steps further and further and further before they finally get to the place where they say, ah, you know, that person's so bad. I'm just going to, you understand what I'm telling you? But the deal is the way you get out of that is you also have to take baby steps. I want to take a giant step and be over at perfection. I want to take a giant step and say, okay, I've removed all that sin from my life, like Josh was talking about. You know, I took out all the stuff from my house that Jesus would be ashamed of, and I burned it and just do it all at once. The problem is there's still more stuff, and, and it's, it's the baby steps we take. And so what, if you want to know how to get to Jesus today, you take a baby step in his direction, 
and you take another one and another one. And as Carol said, at what are you about 61 years old? And uh, as Carol said, uh, as you get older, God points out these things and says, you know, a little bit more. The Bible tells us that we are saved when we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, when we allow him to take our sins upon him, we make him Lord of our lives. We're saved, but it also says we are being saved, which means we are being sanctified. We are being sanctified means set apart for use by God. We are being sanctified. We are becoming more and more like Christ every day. And as we're doing that, as we're becoming more and more like Christ, we're, we're moving toward that perfection, toward that finishing, to that place when finally we stand before Jesus Christ and we are stand in him. Uh, how does it go? I stand in him complete. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. I sang that song at my dad's funeral, and I could just see him standing there saying, you know, Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid all to him I owe. Um, so anyway, you asked about sin. So the deal is we're still going to sin. Uh, but we strive as Christians, as born-again Christians, uh, as children of God, we strive not to sin. And when we do sin, it bothers us. It bothers us. And we have guilt. And those are things God allows into our lives to keep us on this path. And to remember, you know, hey, I get to not do these things so that I get to stay out of trouble. Um, and so we're still going to sin, but we need to put behind us those habitual sins, the things that we can put behind us. Now, how many of you are capable of stopping your sin? None of you. Okay? You can't do it. Jesus can do it. You can allow Jesus to do it in your life, but you can't do it. If your problem is too many brownies, okay, and there are brownies around you all the time. You go to your work or wherever it is. Um, it's one of the problems with cruise ships. Uh, there's food everywhere, all the time. And so you, you're like, oh, I got to go rest for a few minutes because I'm going to have to go eat again in about an hour. Right? And uh, I got to go buy it. You know, hey, the pizza place is open. And you know what I found out they had at the pizza place? They had roast beef. And, and that lady, I made friends with her. And uh, she, gave me, I, she gave me a lot extra, so I pulled out a $5 bill and left it there for her. You put this in your pocket. And next time I came up there, she loaded me up. <laughs> the problem is, is if, if the brownies are around the house, or if the brownies are around where you are, you're going to be tempted. You're going to be taking them, and, and you can't get away from them. You, you, you're going to be, yeah, Dorda. You're going to realize you're going to find brownies in places you didn't know there were brownies. If you're trying to put some sin behind you, you're going to find it in places you didn't know it was there. Let's say your problem is porn and you've decided, okay, I'm going to put this behind me. I'm not going to get into this anymore. And I tell you what, you turn on the TV on Disney Channel. And you're going to find something that you shouldn't be watching. And you're going, but I'm on Disney Channel. <laughs> I'm telling you that um, Satan's going to put some brownies around. And you can't do it, but you can do it through the power of Jesus Christ. And uh, it's only through his power. It's only through giving it to him that you can get those things. So when you talk about sin, you're talking about giving sin up. Um, we can't do it. But through the power of Jesus Christ, we can. Through him, he can. And we, we live in his power. And our sins are forgiven. So the Bible tells us that when we, uh, when we become saved, when we give our lives to Jesus Christ, uh, I was reminded of a guy who was telling his testimony, and he said, you know, when I was a kid, uh, I gave my sins to Jesus. But that's all I did. I didn't give him my life. I didn't give him my heart. I just gave him my sins. And that's not what we're talking about here. 
we're talking about giving your life to Christ. Uh, the Bible says that the old self is, is gone away and you, you are now the new self. When we baptize, it's a picture of that, right? You are buried with him in Christ and raised to walk in newness of life. It's a picture of dying to what you want and being raised to what Christ wants. And so uh, when, we, when we do that, when we give our sin to Christ, he takes it on and we give him our heart, give him our life. He becomes our Savior. He becomes our Lord. Anybody know what the word Lord means? You call somebody Lord, it's a pretty big deal, isn't it? Right? And so we call him Lord because he becomes our Lord. And when he does, when he does that, he takes all your sin and your sin is forgiven past, present, and future. All your sin is forgiven. All your sin is forgiven past, present, future. All your sin. You say, well, huh, my future sin's forgiven? Bring on the brownies. <laughs> I can have all the brownies I want now because I'm forgiven in the future. Is that true? Am I forgiven? Yes, I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. The problem is that I love the Christ who died on the cross for me, and I don't want to hurt him, and so I choose to not have brownie, too many brownies, <laughs> to not have an inappropriate amount of brownies because I love him and I don't want to hurt him. Um, I choose to be faithful to my wife for lots of reasons, but the main reason is because I don't want to hurt her. Because I love her. I choose to be faithful to Christ because I love him. Why do I love him? Because of what he did for me. Uh, what's the Bible verse? He first loved us. What is it? We love him because he first loved us. Boy, y'all are good at remembering Bible verses almost as good as me. Uh, in any case, uh, we're forgiven of our sins, and that means, and, and Paul said, just because you're forgiven of your sins is not a license for you to go out and sin some more. That's not what that's about. You're forgiven of your sins. And so, um, so what does that mean? So if I die without asking for forgiveness of my last sin, do I go to hell? No, because I'm forgiven of all my sins, past, present, and future. Some people think that um, suicide is, is the unforgivable sin. It's not. It's not. The unforgivable sin is not accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Um, we call that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the only unforgivable sin. And that is, uh, at some point in time, at some day, you're going to be listening to somebody, whether it's a family member, a preacher, a teacher, whatever, you're going to hear uh, that Jesus is Lord and that you ex should accept him and make him Lord of your life, you're going to hear that. And the Holy Spirit's going to tell you, this is true. And what you then have to decide is, am I going to accept this? Am I going to accept this as truth? Or am I going to just say, no, I'm not going to accept that. I'm pushing it aside. Uh, Holy Spirit, I'm calling you a liar, and I'm not going to accept that because I don't believe it's true. When you do that, that's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. When you tell the Holy Spirit, this is not true, you know, the Holy Spirit is telling you this Jesus stuff is true, and you're saying, no, it's not true, I'm going to find my own way to heaven, then that is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's the only unforgivable sin. So the only unforgivable sin is not accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior before you meet him in person. Which reminds me of the story of the guy, the priest who went into the bar uh, and he saw all these guys that he knew, young men, and he said, uh, Peter, uh, do you want to go to heaven? And he goes, uh, well, well uh, yeah. And he goes, and what about you, Todd? What are you doing? And he's talking to these guys. Do you want to go to heaven? And they go, well, well, yeah. And he goes, well, why are you being so, so uh, uh, standoffish about this? And they said, oh, I thought you were getting a group to go now. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's like the teacher in the class asked the kids, uh, how do you get to heaven? And the kid said, die. 
So there you go. Okay, so in answer to your question, yes, our sins are forgiven when we accept Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and our sins are forgiven. And, and how are they forgiven? They're forgiven, as we talked about a while ago. God demands that every sin be paid for. Every one of my sins, if I broke your clock, it has to be paid for. Okay? Somebody's got to pay for it. Jesus paid for it. Okay? How can Jesus pay for my sin? Because he didn't have any to pay for of his own. Okay? You can pay for your sin with an eternity in hell, or you can let Jesus pay for it for you. That's all there is to it. That's what the Bible says. That's not what I say. That's what the Bible says. And I expect every one of you to pull out your Bibles and look in there and see if what I said was true. Okay? I expect you to do that. Um, I expect you to listen to the Holy Spirit and say, you know, that's what we're doing. That's what we do every time we come to church, isn't it? Every time Devin opens his mouth, the Holy Spirit in you says, okay, wait a minute. Uh, and uh, talking to the Holy Spirit and me, uh, is that true? Yeah, Devin's got that one right, okay? And you get that from the Holy Spirit in you. But you, check your Bible. Your Bible says, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Did I answer your question? Who else has a question? Yes, sir. Church hopping. Okay. Is that a bad thing or a good thing? Okay. Um, so the question is, um, uh, Charles knows of a church that's teaching Calvinism, and he wants to know what that's all about. First off, let me tell you that I am not an expert on Calvinism, okay? But let me tell you what I do know. Um, Calvinists believe... Uh, well, let me go back a little bit. Do you remember in the Bible where it says that you were predestined to be sons of God? Remember where it says that right in the Bible? Okay. Um, so what does that mean? And I've told you before that what I believe the Bible says about that is that when God started all this, and he says, okay, I'm going to create the universe, I'm going to create the world, and so on and so forth, and uh, Adam and Eve and Abraham and Noah and all those people, that's not quite the right order. But anyway, <laughs> all the way down to uh, Edwin and Penny and George and Irma, uh, who are going to have children, Anna Fair and Dennis, who are going to have a son named Devin. Okay? And so in the beginning, God's looking, and he's, he can see all this because he's not bound by time. Okay? See all this. And he's going to see that when Devin is nine years old, standing on the second pew on the organ side of the church of be the right hand side of the church in First Baptist Church of Beeville on the second verse of the Savior is waiting I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to him and I'm going to say you need to accept this Jesus Christ and Devin's going to say and what what does God do he didn't make me say anything did he no but he can look into the future and see oh Devin said yes okay so from the beginning of time God knew that I would say yes God did not make me say yes, okay? God knew that I was going to say yes. But from the beginning of time, if you're standing at the beginning of the time looking at that, you would say, I was predestined to accept Jesus Christ. You understand what I'm saying here? Okay. It wasn't that God made me accept him. It wasn't that God did anything other than bless my family such that uh, because they were faithful and they prayed for me, our family's been praying for me, been praying for my kids, Lisa's, Lisa, her kids, my family, uh, the missionaries in China, I'm telling you, they were in, in a concentration camp for nine months in China. They were in a Japanese concentration camp for nine months because they were telling people about Jesus. That's why they were in that camp, because they were missionaries. And I can tell you 100%, I am positive that during those nine months, those, my great aunts and great uncles, were praying for me. And I had not even been thought of yet. 
They were praying for me. They were praying that. Yeah, I know that my family was praying for me. I know that they knew that my that that my grandfather would have a daughter, and that she would sometime uh, they would have children, and, and sometimes so down there. I know they were praying for me. They didn't know my name. They didn't know anything about me, but they, they prayed for the kids that would come, for the family that would come. They prayed for me. I was, uh, that's the reason that I found Jesus Christ at nine years old. Instead of being older and having to go through a whole bunch of stuff to get there, I was blessed because those people were faithful to God and brought me to Jesus so that I could then meet him at the age of nine. So in any case, God in the beginning saw that I am going to say yes. God didn't make me say yes. He didn't cause me to say yes. He didn't twist my arm. He didn't do anything like that. But he knew I was going to say yes. And so the Bible says I was predestined to be saved. Now, how do you interpret that in the Bible? Well, that's one way to interpret it. Another way to interpret that is to say, okay, in the beginning, God said, uh, you, 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 not you, 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 and you are going to be saved. The rest of you are not. Okay? Predestination. That means God chose you and not you. Okay? And that's not the way it works. And you can say, well, how do you know that's not the way it works? Because in Revelation, it says, um, they said, uh, God, why are you taking so long? You know, look how bad this world is. Why are you taking so long? Why, why hasn't Jesus come back yet? Why hasn't God judged the earth? And God says that he wants everyone to come to repentance, that none would be lost. He's not slow in keeping promises like some people are slow in keeping promises. He wants everyone to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's what Revelation says. Is that right? Yes. Some of you have read that. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So what that means is if you take the Bible as a whole and you take that part that says you're predestined to become sons of God and you put all that together, you say, oh, then Pastor Devin must be explaining this correctly in that God did not specifically choose him or make him be, a, uh, make him choose yes when it was time to accept Jesus. But instead, God saw through the future that Devin was going to choose yes, and therefore Devin was predestined. You understand what I'm telling you? Calvinists, however, as I understand it, and, and I could be wrong, please do not send letters, uh, unless... <laughs> Unless you want to send me an email and ask me a question, and I'll do the research for you. But uh, Calvinists believe that uh, God predestined this person to be saved and this person to be saved, but not that person. And so Calvinists believe, I don't really need to work at this. I don't, I don't, I don't need to go out and knock on people's doors. I don't need to be Randy Lockwood and, and the Grow Group who take out bags and knock on people's door and tell them about Jesus. I don't need to invite people to church or do anything like that. You know why? Because God's already chosen who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved. So I don't really need to work at this. And that's what Calvinists believe. And so a Baptist church, for example, who, who starts teaching Calvinism, there's like five tenets of Calvinism. I don't remember what they are. But the biggest one that I have a problem with is this whole thing of where we don't need to do anything because God's already chosen who it is. Uh, but it very well may be that you're the person that God chose to tell that person about Jesus, and you choose not to, guess what? You know, you, you may be saved and you may get to heaven, but you're going to see, oh, no, I was supposed to tell that person about Jesus, and they're in hell because I didn't tell them about Jesus. I didn't represent Jesus. Yes, ma'am. You mean like the 144,000? I believe the, is it the Mormons that believe only 144,000 are going to make it to heaven and the rest of them? The Jehovah Witness, is that it? Uh, and there's only 144,000 that's going to make it to heaven and the rest of them are going to just be glorified and live here on the earth or something like that. Um, I, I, don't, I don't pretend to know anything about anything other than Southern Baptists, okay? 
Uh, but uh, yes, there are certain people, certain religions uh, that believe there's only a certain number uh, that's going to be in heaven and therefore they don't have to work uh, to get that. Is that the question? Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I do know that there is an exact number who is predestined in the sense that from the beginning of time, God looked right across there and he saw who was going to accept him, who wasn't. And God knows the number of who actually ended up choosing him before Jesus Christ came, the second coming, whatever. So, yes, there is a number. Uh, God knows the number and he knows it because he knows everything. And he's not bound by time, and he can see what's going to happen down there. Okay, uh, so there's yes, there is a number. Uh, Satan does not know the number, according to Doctor Missler. Uh, every time somebody gets saved, uh, Satan gets a shock. Uh, you know, because oh, somebody got saved. Is that it? Jesus is coming back, right? Because the rapture is going to happen. Jesus is going to come get us. As soon as the, the last person gets saved that God knew was going to get saved before the rapture, uh, Satan has not known when that's going to be. So every time that clock, that number, that uh, scoreboard clicks over, Satan goes, is this it? Is this the one? And the next one, is this it? Is this the one? And so Dr. Missler says that Satan's been in shock treatment for 2,000 years. Uh, <laughs> But in reality, that's not true because you uh, you know that uh, certain prophecies said that Israel had to be back to be a nation. So really, Satan's only been in shock treatment since about 1948. Yeah. But anyway, did I answer your question? More or less? Okay. Uh, the answer is uh, we we steer away from Calvinist beliefs. And I personally would not be a member of a church that um, that followed Calvinistic teachings. True, true. And, and I'm sure there are some facets of Calvinism that fit right with what we're teaching here too, right? Okay, and so that's why we have so many churches, right? Because that church over there believes you can, you, you need to do this, but this church over here believes that. And so how are you going to interpret this scripture right here? And so, why are we here today? Because we're all Baptists and we believe that we interpret this scripture this way. And that's why we're here together. So uh, I'm not putting anybody down. Uh, will there be Calvinists in heaven? Yes. Will there be Muslims in heaven? Yes. There's, there's people who are born Muslims who accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior and they're going to be there. Will there be purple people in heaven? Yes. Will there be... Um, chartreuse people, yes. There will be all, every kind of group of people you can group up, there will probably be one of them in heaven because they found Jesus Christ. There's only one way. There's only one way to get there. there is only one way, and that is through Jesus Christ. The, he's the way, the truth, and the life. He's not just a truth. He's the truth. He's not a way. He's the way. He's not a life. He's the way. So uh, I know we're a couple minutes over, and just give me two more minutes. Every day we face difficulties. And like as Amber asked at the beginning, the reason that we face difficulties is because God wants us to turn to him. That's the reason. If there were no difficulties in my life, I would not need God, would I? I'd be Fat, dumb, and happy? Wait a minute. Hold on. I might already be there. Um, if, uh, if we didn't have difficulties in our life, we wouldn't turn to God. So, as I said this morning, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. 
And some people say, well, you know, how, if God's God, how come I have trouble? How come this thing happened to me? And the reason this thing happened to you is because God said, uh, I'm not going to make you robots. I'm going to make you individuals, beings that can choose yes or no, can choose to love me or not to love me, can choose to follow me or not to follow me. How many of you would prefer to be a robot besides me? I'd prefer to be a robot. But um, we don't want to be robots. We want God to make us so that we have free will of choice. The problem is we don't want anybody else to have free will of choice because they'll choose to hurt us. They'll choose to do things wrong. And so that's really the problem. And so nothing happens to you and your family that's not father-filtered if you're his child. Um, we've talked about the idea before. If I create a robot and my robot says, I love you, Daddy, right? Is that valuable? Well, it's valuable to me because I'm an engineer. And I'm like, oh, cool, look at the robot on me, right? But if the house catches on fire, I'm going to grab my child and carry them out before I start worrying about the robot. The exact same thing is true with God. You are his creation until you are his child. And the Bible is very clear about that. That's why we hear this stuff about being born again. You're born again into the family. You're born into the family. You become God's child. Uh, somebody said God would never let one of his children go to hell. That's 100% true. If you are a child of God, you don't have any worries. You have some battles to fight here on the earth, but the war's already been won. You're okay. But if you're not a child of God, you're his creation. You're still There's a bunch of people out there that are God's creation. He created them. He, he made all this happen, but they're not his children, right? Okay? And so the Bible says, in this world, my children, you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. And Jesus says, I'm going to go with you through this. Uh, Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together for good. Oh, let's stop there, right? No, that's not what it says. It says, all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. I have people, and I, you know, I go to visit people in the hospital. I hear people talking. Don't worry. All things work together for good. I'm telling you, they don't. They only work together for good for those who are who love God, who are called according to his purpose, who are saved, who are part of his family. If you're not part of his family, you can't claim that all things work together for good. I'm sorry, you don't get it. At the reading of my will, which may not be too far out, at the reading of my will, you may show up and say, what did Devin leave me? And somebody's going to say to you, why would Devin leave you something? Well, why wouldn't he? Because you're not one of his children. Right? When, uh, uh, you know, if, if we want to inherit what God has, we have to be one of his children. And that's, that's the way it works. Questions? I'm sorry we're over time. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We've talked about a whole bunch of things today, Lord. I ask that you would somehow bring those back to our mind this week so that we might focus on them, so that we might uh, meditate on them, and so your Holy Spirit can point out those things in our hearts and in our minds and allow us to see those things so that we might grow closer to you. Lord, I pray that you'd bless us. I pray that you would give us courage to step up and give you every part of our lives. Lord, every sin that we have, every good thing we think we have, everything about us, Lord, give us courage to give it all to you because you know everything. You can see the future. And so if we trust you, if we get on your path, Lord, then no matter what happens to us, we know that you're in control and you're in charge and that you're going to somehow work it out for good, either for us or for our children or for somebody around us. We know that you're going to fulfill your promises because you always have. Lord, we ask that you bless us this week. Remove obstacles from those who couldn't be here today. Allow us to, uh, to serve you this week, to minister in your name. Give us courage to step forward and do that. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you want to talk some more, I'm here for a while. Here, John. <laughs>